again, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, introductory lecture. And uh, now we will have the introduction uh, will be presented by Nico Cimini. So the floor is Thank yours. you. Thank you very much, Marcial. And um, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, joining. We have now about 20, uh, actually 75 people joining. So that's very good. Thank you very much again. And um, welcome to the first introductory lecture of PROBE. My name is uh, Nico Cimini, and I work for the National uh, Research Council of Italy, and uh, I'm serving as vice chair of uh, PROBE. Today, we introduce the instrument for profiling the atmospheric boundary uh, layer. And, um, but since we have a kind of a heterogeneous uh, audience today, let me first um, introduce you to the um, um, cost and probe. So what's, what's cost action? Um, cost is a European funding scheme for um, cooperation in science and technology. Uh, so it uh, provides fundings for uh, cooperation between scientists in different uh, um, state member. Um, it doesn't provide uh, money for uh, actual science, but just for the um, networking and cooperation. Um, and um, so a few years ago, we um, submitted um, the proposal for PROBE, which stands for Profiling the Atmospheric Boundary Layer at European Scale. And that was accepted, and it started um, about... Um, uh, two years ago, a little bit less, and it will go for a bit more than two years from now. What are the motivations uh, behind PROBE? Well, you might know that the atmospheric boundary layer, ABL, is the single most important undersampled part of the atmosphere. And that's because we have a good coverage of the uh, surface with the um, uh, meteorological surface network, and we have a good coverage of the upper air um, from the satellite sounders, but we have a kind of observational gap in the boundary layer because none of these instruments is particularly good in that region. However, the uh, ABL is particularly important for uh, meteorology, for uh, weather forecast, air quality, aviation, and renewable energy. In addition, ABL was selected as an incubation target um, recommending the implementation of programs to accelerate the readiness of high priority observables. And uh, according to WMO, the top priority atmospheric variables that are not currently adequately measured in the ABL are wind profiles, temperature and humidity profiles, and cloud profiles. So how could we close this observational gap efficiently and cost-effectively at European scale? Well, we propose a structure, a work plan with four working groups, three of which are more technical. So working group two, three, and four um, are more technical and they deal with advanced ABL profiling, tailored measurement networks, and operation and data quality. And then there is one overarching working group, working group one, which um, is about knowledge exchange. So it includes the end user, which provide their requirements to the other three working groups. And the three working groups um, gives back training about the instruments and about the uh, operations. So in this knowledge exchange um, work group, working group, um, this is kind of active member community. So you could part of it, uh, if you are not yet, um, in two ways. You can just sign up for the newsletter and in that case, you will receive the newsletter with our um, um, latest uh, updates and uh, achievements. And, or you can uh, become a probe user, which means you get uh, access to additional resources, including the newsletter, but also um, uh, PowerPoint presentations, or for example, the recording of uh, today's lecture, or uh, also some job postings and things like that. And the link is below here. And in this um, knowledge exchange working group, we have events, three different kinds of e events. The first level is the introductory lectures, as we are doing to today, um, for sharing the updates on state-of-the-art ground-based profiling instruments. Then we have two other levels, 
expert discussions and interactive user, user workshops. So now in our agenda, we have the um, two upcoming events, the two introductory lectures and what, the one of today in which we are uh, going to introduce you to the uh, single instruments. And then uh, a little bit uh, more than one month uh, from now, uh, so 25th of May, we will have another introductory lectures about networks of these instruments. And I hope that if you join today, you will join also in a month from now. So the agenda for today, we will have, um, after my brief introduction, we'll have six 10-minute slots for uh, six different instruments or instrument types, um, in which we will have seven minutes for the lecture. Each lecture will touch um, for each instrument the measurement principle, the observations, uh, strengths and weakness, weaknesses, and um, the advanced products and applications. And then after these seven minutes, we will have three minutes for uh, one or two uh, quick questions. And you can uh, ask questions in the pad. Um, so if you uh, click on this link that is also provided in the Zoom chat, you, it will lead you to a page where you can uh, type text and ask your questions. This is the recommended way because then we can uh, store and collect all the questions and we will uh, answer the questions at the end or during the, um, the three minutes. And also we can uh, then store these questions and answer in our uh, website. Uh, again, you can use the Zoom chat tool to ask questions if you want, but those were, will not be recorded. Or you can raise your hand in Zoom and we will uh, pass the mic to you uh, during the discussion at the end. So, we will have at least 20 minutes discussion, so plenty of time for questions. So if there are no questions up to now and on this first introduction, uh, I will start with the um, uh, micro radiometers, which is the first um, instrument. So maybe Henri or uh, Simone can tell me if there are questions up to now. There is one question we... on the pad already. Okay. Which is, uh, would it be possible to give a similar short presentation on ground-based infrared spectrometers, for example, aeri acids sometime? Yes, that's a good question. And um, we, we did not include it here because uh, we have, uh, at least in Europe, less instruments like that. But uh, it's definitely uh, in um, a technology that we, uh, we have the expert uh, within the action. So we can um, add this into a um, future uh, introductory uh, lecture. Uh, OK, so then uh, I will um, start and then at the end, I will uh, ask questions and then move on and pass the mic to uh, the other speakers. Uh, the other speakers today are Ewan um, O'Connor from FMI, uh, Martial Eflin from IPCL, and Martial is also serving as the chair of this um, cost action. Then Simone Kotaus from IPCL, um, Christine Knis from DWD, and and Isiko from FMI. And they are also serving as a um, co-chair of different working groups. Okay, let's start with macro Um, So what they are, macro radiometers are systems collecting atmospheric natural thermal radiation. Um, the hardware is uh, low maintenance and um, provides automatic operation in all weather conditions. Um, what do they measure? They measure electromagnetic power uh, collected by the antenna per unit area and within a frequency band. And those are called channels. What can you infer from the measurements? Well, it depends on the channels, on the number of channels and the frequency allocation. Uh, but in general, you can um, infer um, some thermodynamics of the atmosphere. So temperature, humidity and uh, uh, cloud liquid. The typical spectral range that is used by these instruments is between 20 and 60 gigahertz. And um, that's because uh, in this range, we have a feature of water vapor, a line absorption of the water vapor. Here you are looking at um, a plot of the absorption coefficients of the atmosphere. 
And uh, so this line uh, is um, a water vapor line absorption. And then you have a large absorption complex by oxygen. And then you ha also have uh, absorption by liquid water. So if you sum all this absorption, you have the total, which is the black line. And usually um, the microradiometer channels are located on the wings of these two features. And uh, here we have water vapor channels and liquid water channels, as well as temperature channels on the oxygen band. So again, the observed thermal radiation comes primarily for the atmospheric gases, oxygen and water vapor, and hydrometers, mainly liquid water. And the measured quantity is radiance, which, uh, which units are uh, watts per meter square per steradiance per Earth, which is not very convenient. In fact, Usually radiance is converted to brightness temperatures uh, to give the um, useful uh, units and convenient units of Kelvin. So brightness temperature um, has the units of Kelvin, but, but indeed measure uh, intensity of radiation. So TB then are inverted to obtain atmospheric variables, uh, temperature profiles, humidity profiles, and also column integrated water in terms of water vapor, integrated water vapor, and liquid water path. And to invert the brightness temperature into uh, atmospheric variables, you need a inversion methods. And typical inversion methods are statistical regression and neural network. Those are usually provided by the uh, manufacturers in the, um, in the software they provide with the instruments. However, there are also other um, inversion methods like uh, optimal estimation or 1D VAR that are more physical. Um, those are not provided by the manufacturers. However, there are already tools that you can download and use with your data. So how can we get the profiling capabilities from passive uh, observations? Well, the idea is to have differential absorptions. So different channels correspond to different absorptions, which means that they can each channel can see uh, um, a different depth in the atmosphere. And this is uh, pictured through the so-called weighting functions. Um, here you see profiles of weighting function, which basically uh, tells you the, uh, the contribution of different layers uh, to the observations. So if you have weighting functions like this that are pretty smooth or with height, it means that you are uh, you can retrieve the water vapor uh, integrated content along the vertical, uh, but also you can have uh, some information about the profile. For the temperature, you have the weighting function that are peaking sharply close to the surface, which means that you can have a, a um, information about the temperature profiles close to the surface in the bundle layer especially. When you have the um, main products, then you have you can infer also derived products. Those are, for example, potential temperature and virtual potential temperature, uh, mixing layer height, uh, forecast indices that are usually used with the radiosons like KO, uh, K-index, or CAPE. Uh, you can also um, estimate inversion height and strength and uh, atmospheric attenuation and so on. Uh, what are the advantages and limitations of this kind of instrumentations? Well, advantages, it's um, the, the hardware is kind of robust. Um, it gives unattended operations and low to moderate maintenance and 27 um, continuous vertical profiles in nearly all weather, which means in clear, cloudy, and up to light precipitation. The limitation is that uh, it provides low to moderate vert vertical resolution. And this is what I try to uh, explain with the weighting functions. Uh, it's useful to uh, have a data monitoring and quality control to, um, um, to check uh, about any drift of the instrument. Um, uh, it needs some cleaning sometimes because it, uh, um, the coverage of the antenna uh, may become dirty and uh, depending on the environment, uh, if you have a lot of dust, then you have um, more frequent uh, uh, cleaning to be done. Um, in addition, most of uh, types requires attended in place service for um, calibration and radon replacement about, um, let's say six months. Uh, and retrievals are not available under rain. Um, here it's a table with the typical accuracy uh, that you can obtain for different uh, um, uh, products. And those have been um, demonstrated and confirmed by uh, many different uh, investigators and uh, in the open literature. 
the types or instruments you can get well uh, you can get um dual triple channel which are made to uh, only estimate the integrated water vapor and liquid water path uh, or you can get uh, temperature profilers uh, single or multiple channel humidity profilers or you can get what are called full profiles, which gives you all the, pro the products uh, I just mentioned. The manufacturers, um, as far as I know, are three, Atex, uh, Radiometrics, and RPG. And those are the top products they uh, offer. Uh, for Atex, they uh, offer a temperature profiler up to one kilometer, single channel with uh, continuous elevation scanning, while both Radiometrics and RPG offer full profilers up to 10 kilometers, multiple channels, and uh, elevation scan, and also azimuthal uh, scan optional. Finally, there is uh, also some research and development going on. And, um, and I have to say that significant advancement was uh, within uh, the European cost actions, including probe. Um, concerning, we are looking at new applications, new market, um, like uh, renewable energy and telecommunications. Uh, also synergy with other instruments, in particular, uh, infrared radiometer and uh, cloud radar for fog uh, detection. Um, also um, synergy with IRE, which is the infrared uh, inf interferometer that has been mentioned in the question before, as well as a dial, the differential um, absorption lighter that will be um, explained in a later uh, lecture. And uh, you can see here uh, just a, um, a quick um, demonstration that when you uh, combine different instruments, then you get uh, reduced uncertainty in temperature and humidity profiles. Finally, numerical weather prediction data simulation. This is really boosting now because uh, since uh, tools uh, were made available and tested, uh, now there are experiments at uh, DWD, Meteo France, and Meteo Suisse at least. Finally, the last um, slide is about networking. Um, since micro will be part of the UMETNET e-profile, so the uh, um, program, the profile program of the European network of uh, MET services. And uh, so the data life cycle will be needed uh, and uh, will be worked out in the next uh, two years. But you will hear more about this on May 25th when we will talk about networks on probe second introductory lecture. So I close, I finish my lecture here. Uh, I hope uh, I was uh, able to um, <clears throat> be clear and fast and um, I'm open for questions uh, before I pass the mic to the next speaker. As you can see from the Fed, there is one uh, remark about uh, price and maintenance which could be limitation to the use of uh, microwave radiometers. Yes. So price, it really depends on, on the, uh, on the um, kind, uh, the type you want to buy, just a temperature profiler or you want a full profiler. Um, so I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I mean, you can always email uh, me and I will give you more information. But I would say that from temperature profilers to put the full profiles you are from 70 to 150 K uh, kilo euros. So that's the, um, the range. And uh, maintenance, um, again, it's, I would say it's low maintenance uh, because you might need to do uh, twice a year uh, the replacement of the radom and the calibration. And um, it's just about um, other instruments. You might have to clean the window uh, once in a while. So I, I still would say that it's um, um, low to moderate maintenance. There are other questions, but maybe it's better to move on and to keep them uh, from the final discussion. Okay, so I will then pass the mic to Yuan O'Connor for the Doppler wind lighters and radar wind profiler. Okay, thanks, Nico. I hope you can hear me and you can see my mouse moving. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the remote sensing of wind to you. Um, and so here I'm going to mainly be talking about uh, Doppler LIDARs and the radar wind profiler, but also we'll mention SODARs as well. Okay, so if we think about uh, these instruments, these are all active remote sensing in that they transmit a signal into the atmosphere um, and then look at the return. Okay, so there's as I said, there's three main types. There's the wind profiler. Now what this does is it transmits in the microwave. 
you get scattering from turbulence in clear air. Um, whereas the Doppler LiDAR, you're transmitting light. And the main scatter you're thinking about here is aerosol. And then for SODAR, you're transmitting sound and you're actually uh, getting scattering back from atmospheric turbulence. OK, so um, all of these, what they're really doing is measuring the radial Doppler velocity. And the important thing to remember is you're actually looking at the component along the line of sight. And I'll explain that in a little, in a little minute. OK, so the maturity of uh, both the radar wind profilers and the SODAR, this is, they are mature. They've been around for some time. Uh, the Doppler LiDAR, at least in a commercial sense, is relatively new, but is also maturing. Now, in some ways, these networks are relatively sparse, uh, but they are increasing over time. OK, so the main thing we're doing with any of these instruments is measuring the radial Doppler velocity. OK, so what does that look like? The idea here is if you imagine I'm looking at the bottom part here, this would be a 2D plot of if you were scanning horizontally, what you would do is you'd measure the wind speed. And here it's um, going from blue is negative wind speed to red is a positive wind speed. OK, and then you would actually be able to identify the wind direction from this. But however, what we really want is the vertical profile. OK, so now, you're, now what we do is we have to scan. Um, and then what you're actually looking at here is if we do a scan of some sort, we're actually trying to now identify the component of the wind that we measure. Because remember, we are actually measuring along the line of sight, but we want the horizontal component. So that's, that's the main question is, how do we retrieve uh, this horizontal component, which is the wind? OK, so there's uh, a number of ways of doing it. Uh, the common ones are Doppler beam swinging, which is called DBS. And then I'll introduce uh, the VAD, which is the conical scan. So here the idea is you have three beams. One is pointing vertically. And then two of these beams are off uh, zenith. So they're normally, you say, 20 degrees away from, uh, from vertical. And the idea then is between these two, if they're orthogonal to each other, you can actually measure the components in the two directions. OK, and then with using trigonometry, you can then actually then derive the horizontal component, which is what you want. And then you would get the horizontal wind speed. And the point is, because you're sending out, normally sending out impulses, you actually get this rather than this just being, um, you actually get range gates here. So you actually get a vertically resolved component. And that's how you actually get your, your profile. Um, a little bit more advanced, if you can do it, you can actually do scanning at a constant uh, constant angle and you change the azimuth so you send up a load of scans like this and then again you're getting the horizontal component um, and then you can use again use trigonometry to then try and estimate your your horizontal wind okay so if we think about um, the sort of instruments that are available at the moment uh, a common one uh, the common wavelengths these days for Doppler lidars especially for the commercial systems is uh, 1.5 to two microns. So there's very specific uh, wavelengths that they use. And this is because they're using telecommunications technology. Um, and uh, this actually means that the systems are relatively cheap to what they used to be. Now, just to let you know that some of these instruments do actually come with a depolarization channel, but most don't. Um, another thing that uh, certainly is the case at the moment, that the technology is advancing very quickly. So there's lots of updates, um, especially in the last five years or so. I okay, guess so if we think about the sort of things that you might have heard of, there's a lot of, there's two uh, main companies that are providing quite small instruments. Um, by this, I mean less than, say, 100 kilos. In other words, two people can carry them. So these are truly mobile. And um, this would be the Leosphere systems, which are now owned by Vaisala. Um, so this would be the WindCube 100S, 200S, 400S. And here I'm referring to instruments that can scan all the way to the top of the boundary layer. And then Halo Photonics also do this where they have a streamline range. Um, there's a streamline, the Pro and the XR, which are also similar to this in that they have slightly different capabilities. And again, all of these, nearly all of these are full hemispheric scanning. So they can scan anywhere uh, in the hemisphere. So you can choose your own scan pattern. Um, other instruments that are much larger, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, Leonardo and Lockheed Martin do also make Doppler LiDARs. But these are much, much larger. So these are container-based. Um, you know, these, so these are a, a few tons. And there are a few of these at airports. Uh, but these are normally used more for uh, measuring things like shear near airports. OK, but these systems are still used um, in the research arena. But bear in mind, if you look at the size of these, 
Okay, they might be more sensitive, but they're also quite a lot more expensive. When we think about uh, radar wind profilers, um, again, there's a few frequencies that uh, they can operate at. And if we think about ones that can actually see the whole of the boundary layer, uh, there tends to be two uh, sets at the moment. So one is um, these sort of uh, longer frequencies, so 400 to 500 megahertz, normally called UHF. And here's an example here from Bayreuth in Germany. Now these are quite large, so that would be about 50 meters square, this sort of instrument here. Um, and then there's this other range, which are operating at slightly higher frequencies, uh, and they're, they're much smaller. So this is now more, say, five meters by five meters. Okay, so the first one, um, this one here can see all the way to the, the tropopause and probably much, much further. Uh, whereas this one can usually see to about one and a half to two kilometers. So we'll, we'll cover the boundary layer. And if we go for SODAR models, again, I'm only thinking about the extended altitude range instruments. Uh, so ones that can see above one kilometer. Uh, again, there's two, two main manufacturers here, which are Remtech and Metech. And again, these, this is probably about, say, uh, five meters by five meters. So these are much larger than some of the instruments that are quite often used for nearer surface profiling. Okay, so one of the challenges uh, for most of these, um, generally, uh, these instruments operate 24-7 uh, continuously, and there's not really any um, issues with regards to keeping them operating. It's just the actual data availability might be hampered by strong winds. So if you have very, very strong winds, then you might exceed the measurement range of the instrument. Um, and if it's very strong winds also for the SODAR, then it actually means that there's too much noise. Uh, for radar wind, pro, uh, radar wind profilers, you have to think about birds and wind farms. Um, you actually see these in the data, so you'd have to be able to deal with that. And then for Doppler LiDAR and radar wind profilers, uh, especially at higher frequencies, precipitation is also an issue. Um, you think that precipitation is generally an issue for most uh, LiDAR uh, types anyway. Um, since all of these instruments actually depend on uh, there being enough signal, for Doppler LiDARs, if you have a very, very clean atmosphere, then again, uh, your signals aren't so good and you can't always see as far as you would like to. And also clouds and fog are also a bit of a problem. But uh, generally, for the instruments I've shown here, they can all see to the top of the boundary layer during most conditions. And actually, uh, rather than it being a signal to noise issue, um, so there's always enough signal to get a retrieval, Actually, when it comes to retrieving the winds, the issue is to do with the homogeneity. So when you're doing your scan, you're assuming that, that um, uh, everything is homogeneous. And that's not quite true, especially when it's strongly turbulent. Um, we can identify this and we can actually mitigate this a little bit by uh, doing how we're doing the scanning. So that's a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment during this uh, probe project. Um, so careful processing is also key for these instruments. For example, um, if we think about what's been done in previous actions or the current action, I think like a radar winter profiler has, there's been a lot of work on bird clutter processing. And we've been actually looking at how you actually uh, derive the velocity uncertainty for the instruments. Um, do you have to perform background corrections? And one of the interesting ones is how you're doing the scan selection optimization for wind profiling. So are you, if you're interested in capturing the whole of the boundary layer, how best to do that? And there's a few other things that we're also looking at. And one of the important ones is the impact of turbulence on the wind retrieval. In other words, when, can, when is your assumption valid? Um, if we think about advanced products, um, if we think about, we can obviously, once you have your wind profile, you can get wind shear and then immediately provide wind shear alerts. Um, and if we're looking at the high temporal variation in velocity, we can use this actually to give us the turbulent properties. So that, although there might be a problem for deriving winds, we can actually still use those to actually find out more about the, what the turbulent properties are. And we're thinking about the different instrument advantage. Uh, the SODARs have a strong advantage in very shallow boundary layers, as in those less than 100 meters deep, uh, because these are the other instruments that tend to be limited to 100 meters or even 500 meters in the case of the radar wind profiler. Um, the advantage of the, the radar wind profilers is that they can get the boundary layer top all the way to the boundary layer top. So not just to, uh, to the base of the cloud, but they can go above that. Um, and again, sometimes the disadvantages can also be turned into advantages. Um, so there's actually uh, plenty of cases now where the radar wind profilers are actually 
<laughs> looking at bird migration monitoring. So you can actually follow uh, when the birds are ready to migrate. And another thing that um, if you can do all the corrections, correct, um, you can actually also use a Doppler LiDAR in the same way as an ALC, which will be uh, talked about later. Again, uh, other interesting things we can do is detection of low level jets. So here we have a, a profile of time height, profile of wind speed. And you can see that we have strong winds here in the orange and green of over 10 meters per second, while it's calm, say five meters per second above and below. You can see here in the wind direction, there's wind shear associated with that. And we also have, even have the turbulence associated with that. Okay, and that means that we can actually start to run through this and actually get low level jet climatologies, uh, which has been part of the work of the previous action. Um, and the other thing that we're also doing, especially now that we have winds and turbulence, we can start to do things like uh, combining multiple Doppler LiDAR products to then get towards things like boundary layer classification. So the idea is we can actually have our uh, plots of wind, wind shear, skewness, and uh, dissipation rate, combine these, and get a classification, and then we can actually take that further to say something about um, where is the mixing? Is this mixing connected to the surface if you're interested in dispersion? Um, and also what is the source of the turbulence? Because it could be the clouds, it could be the surface, or it could be shear. Okay, so there's a, a lot of work going on in this field um, and join the action to find out more. Um, I can see there's a question actually here, which is how much wind is too strong for data availability? Uh, this is interesting. Um, so there's a difference between what the instruments can actually measure um, so the point is that if you think about a wind speed of 50 kilometers an hour, quite strong winds, if you were uh, pointing horizontally, uh, then that would fall out of the range of most of the instruments. But if you're scanning um, at, say, 70 degrees uh, from horizontal, then you're only looking at a component of it. So um, typically, um, I think the maximum range for most instruments is around about 40 meters per second. Uh, but what you do is, depending on where you are, you would select the angle that you're scanning at to make sure that then, even if you have very, very strong winds, the component is still within uh, what, you're, what you're able to see with the system. Um, and then if you think about what is the minimum wind speed, um, well, that depends on the resolution of the yeah. instrument, but the instrument resolution for many of these is on the orders of centimeters per second, and certainly less than half a meter per second. Okay, maybe we need to move on to the next, so. Uh, yeah. So good afternoon. I'm uh, Martial Hefflin from IPSL in, in Paris, and I'm going to talk to you about Doppler cloud radars. Um, we are interested in, in studying the formation evolution of clouds, which uh, involve multiple and complex processes, and in particular, um, the evolution of uh, hydrometeors that come in many sizes and shapes. These can be observed uh, both from in situ uh, measurements on board aircrafts or balloons, but also using remote sensing from space and from the ground and using Doppler cloud radars. So what are these Doppler cloud radars? Um, they are emitting millimeter waves uh, and getting a signal backscattered from hydrometeors uh, through a Rayleigh scattering regimes. And we use uh, principally uh, two frequencies, 35 and 95 gigahertz in the KA and W band, because those are two frequencies at which the atmospheric transmission is uh, maximum when we consider uh, different gases such as uh, water vapor and oxygen. And at these frequencies, the main attenuation is actually come from the larger uh, precipitation uh, droplets. So the quantities that we want to measure are the reflectivity of these hydrometeors, as well as their uh, Doppler uh, velocity. The reflectivity is uh, not measured directly. What we measure is actually the power that is uh, received back to the uh, radar uh, through the echo of the emitted signal echoed by the hydrometeors. 
uh, to uh, retrieve the reflectivity, we have to add to this uh, received power uh, the amount of uh, signal that has been attenuated by the uh, atmosphere in both ways. The effect also for the distance between uh, the radar and the uh, hydrometeors and also a calibration uh, constant that need to be determined. And that can be determined uh, from uh, targets, for instance, that have a known uh, reflectivity. There are uh, several types of uh, cloud radars, um, typically operating either uh, using continuous waves uh, that have been to be encoded using, uh, for instance, frequency modulation or pulsed uh, waves where each uh, pulse is independent from uh, each other. Uh, cloud radars come also in a single or uh, double uh, polarization, which uh, allows to give information on the hydrometeor uh, shapes and also uh, are either in a configuration of vertically pointing to sound the atmosphere above the radar or with scanning capabilities to get a more uh, volume view of the atmosphere. So because of these different uh, capabilities, uh, power, uh, the, the data quality can, uh, can be uh, different and also the size and weight of the instrument can vary uh, significantly. So we have here three manufacturers, RPG and, and Modem, uh, that uh, propose a frequency modulate continuous wave um, systems, predominantly at 94 uh, gigahertz, and then the Metec that provides pulsed uh, radar at 35 uh, gigahertz. Now, uh, from these uh, measurements, uh, we, we can use several uh, of the measured properties to actually identify um, and classify the hydrometeors in the uh, atmosphere. So for instance, using uh, reflectivity, uh, we have here uh, time and height uh, cross sections. We can see that there is um, a wide range of uh, reflectivity depending on the uh, uh, amount and size of hydrometeors in the atmosphere from ice clouds to uh, liquid clouds. Also, the Doppler velocity uh, allows us to distinguish, for instance, the precipitating uh, regime of the, of the clouds, so the rain, and also updrafts and downdrafts in the clouds. The uh, depolarization ratio can uh, help us to um, uh, look at the, uh, the shape of, uh, of uh, the hydrometeors and in particular the melting layer inside the clouds and then the um, turbulence or the spectral width in the Doppler spectra uh, can also help us to identify areas of uh, higher turbulence uh, or more variance like in the in the rain. So all these parameters are, are used to do to derive target classification. Uh, next to access the cloud uh, microphysics uh, we have to know that the, the reflectivity of a, of, a, uh, of a volume is actually proportional to the sixth power of the size of uh, the hydrometeors. Um, and the, the quantity that we're interested in, for instance, like the liquid water content itself is proportional to the third power of the size of the hydrometeors. So the relationship between uh, reflectivity and liquid water content actually depend on the size distribution. As you can see on this figure, the relationship between the two variables is different for non-precipitating clouds, which are typically smaller droplets, precipitating clouds that include larger droplets, and then the raindrops, which is yet another um, size distribution regime. Um, other advanced uh, products that are, are, uh, can be derived from uh, cloud radar measurements are, for instance, um, for fog monitoring. The, uh, what we're seeing here, again, the time height cross section of the reflectivity, the top left, we will have vertical uh, profile of this uh, reflectivity, giving us some information about liquid water content and, and droplet size. And in particular, also, we can uh, infer the uh, evolution of the fog top height, which is an interesting indicator uh, for fog dissipation. 
Also, when we have scanning cloud radars, then in addition to reflectivity and vertical velocity, we can then infer some uh, information about the wind inside the clouds, uh, wind speed and, and direction. And uh, for instance, um, retrieve uh, wind shear, an important wind shear in some uh, cloud situation. Finally, um, the uh, network that we have currently uh, in, in Europe uh, consists of about 20 uh, cloud radars, and they are mostly operated by um, academic uh, stakeholders, uh, university research uh, centers. Um, there is, however, a potential for, for further development of this uh, network, in particular for FOG applications uh, that could involve a more operational uh, stakeholders such as um, airports. So I thank you for your uh, attention. I'll be happy to answer some questions. I don't know if there is any or any questions. Uh, there is one comment on the pad uh, from Emiliano Orlandi says that RPG is also producing and selling uh, frequency modulated continuous wave radar systems at 94 and 35 right. gigahertz and also right. combined. Yes, so I, I did mention the 94 gigahertz uh, frequency. And yes, there is a, now also a, a new product where this instrument is also pro, uh, available at 35 gigahertz and, and the combination of both. Yes. Okay, I don't see uh, other questions on the pod, neither in the chat. So in the interest of time, um, maybe we can uh, move on to the next uh, instrument and speaker. It should be me. Okay, okay, good. So that's easy. <laughs> okay, Simone, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will uh, go on with uh, automatic gliders and salometers uh, that are the next system we want to introduce. These uh, are optical instruments that we use for aerosol and cloud profiling. We can think of them as uh, simple aerosol lidars, usually working on one uh, single wavelength. As uh, for some of the other measurements that we have heard before, um, they are very low maintenance and uh, operate in basically all weather conditions. The main products that we directly get from the sensors are cloud base height and attenuated backscatter profiles. The measurement principle uh, is a bit similar to the um, LIDAR, um, Doppler LIDAR that you mentioned before, only that we have one uh, beam that is continuously uh, shooting in one direction into the atmosphere, where it is partly absorbed and partly backscattered into different directions. And uh, some of this um, light that is uh, uh, scattered back into the direction of the sensor is then received or collected by a receiver and depending on uh, the round trip time that it takes for the light to travel up and down the atmosphere, um, we can uh, make uh, construct this profile of attenuated backscatter, which also of course depends a bit on uh, the characteristics of the LIDAR itself. Um, as uh, we have uh, quite a lot of different systems out there. So we have ASC from a range of manufacturers that are working on different wavelengths, we see that um, we have quite a diverse um, operation going on. Some of these um, measurements also have uh, depolarization cap capabilities. Um, this is a technology that has just recently come up in the ALC technology, and it helps to distinguish uh, different aerosol particles. In general, we see a very fast moving um, advances in the ALC technology, uh, both in terms of hardware and the instrument internal software. And this leads us to um, the situation that we need to um, yeah, keep in mind that the capabilities between the systems can differ and we therefore have uh, also a different type of data quality. And this is not only uh, between uh, instruments from different manufacturers, but also because we have uh, different generations and uh, advancing products from the um, from one manufacturer themselves. So um, it is part of the probe um, initiative that we understand how these systems can work together and how they compare. 
Um, and due to these advances in technology, we can now record attenuated backscatter profiles at, at very high resolution, uh, lo lower than 30 meter in the vertical and very high temporal resolution. There are two very important uh, instrument characteristics that affect the attenuated backscatter, which is the optical overlap um, between the receiver and the transmitter beam. So um, close to the sensor, the receiver um, telescope may um, not see the whole um, beam that is transmitted um, out to the atmosphere. So we have to correct for the incomplete optical overlap and maybe also account for the fact that data may not be usable very close to the sensor itself. In terms of data quality in the higher ranges, the signal to noise ratio is an important aspect because um, the further we get from the sensor, the higher the noise uh, that contributes to the signal. Usually we have rather high aerosol content in the atmospheric boundary layer, so the signal to noise ratio is really good. And um, some of the advanced AAC are also able to measure uh, molecular scattering in the free troposphere. Here, for example, we see a comparison to an aerosol LIDAR. Of course, we have more noise from in the ASC, but on average, um, there, there is some good agreement. The other product um, that we get from the ASC is uh, the cloud-based height. So um, some of the ASC that are measuring <clears throat> are only recording the cloud-based height but um, uh, more and more instruments give also the attenuated backscatter profile. Um, we, can, uh, have, we have a very strong signal uh, from the clouds because they give a very strong attenuation of the laser beam. If we have a very strong, uh, thick water cloud, the beam is fully attenuated and we cannot see what is happening above the cloud, which is, um, for example, uh, the case here above this cloud. But if we have broken clouds or thin clouds, we can actually detect several cloud layers at the same time. And these products um, are provided um, by the instrument internal software. Not only the cloud-based height, but also cloud cover products uh, can be obtained. For example, here we see a map of cloud cover across Europe, um, across the ePROFA network, which shows very nicely the ALC networking capabilities. And these products are, um, widely established and already used in NWP data simulation. In uh, probe and previous cost actions, we have worked very uh, hard on uh, correction procedures that um, are necessary to improve these products from the ALC and also uh, to see how, uh, what needs to be done to actually get uh, real quantities of attenuated backscatter in absolute calibration. So, um, we keep continue working on these aspects to get very high or quality products from these rather simple sensors. As mentioned before, the strength of the ASC is that um, we have very many uh, in operation. Across Europe, we have hundreds of ASC operated by national weather services, but also academic sites and um, at airports and so on. And it's part of uh, the probe initiative to work towards harmonization of these networks. In terms of advanced products, um, we can use ASC for a lot of different things. Um, one uh, very popular aspect is the tracking of elevated layers that may be uh, moving above the AVL, but then also uh, may entrain into the atmospheric boundary layer at some time. For example, here, if you go to this um, uh, to the e-profile uh, example here where they tracked Saharan dust uh, moving across the continent using the ASC network. And also um, we need to mention that the new depolarization capabilities of some of the ALC can be used to uh, better characterize the different uh, aerosol types. Another application of ASC is uh, near real-time uh, fog alerts. We can use um, the fact that uh, a, the attenuated backscatter of the ASC um, captures the hygroscopic growth of the particles, and we can use this to uh, get information on fog uh, formation. And uh, there are in, within probe some uh, algorithms being developed to um, get um, early uh, warning of um, fog situations at different European airports. 
And finally, there's a lot of work happening um, for the automatic detection of uh, the boundary layer height, uh, which includes the mixed layer height and also height, um, the residual layer heights. Um, we have uh, several different um, automatic algorithms that are being compared and evaluated with uh, very yeah, improving performance across the board. And also there's work done to characterize the ABL both in terms of cloud type and uh, aerosol signature. So that's for the ALC part. We Okay, yeah, we have two questions uh, on the pad. So the first one is from Marcus. How reliable are derived uh, cloud-based heights in the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere compared to the ones in the uh, ABL? Um, I cannot give you a number of this. Um, obviously, the, um, um, the closer you are to the ground, the better uh, you have the signal. We can uh, get um, very good um, detection of the water clouds that are um, yeah, connected or in close to the atmospheric boundary layer. Cirrus cloud detection is also possible. And of course, it depends on the power of the system. And I would say that it's improving uh, with the advances in technology that we see in the ALC systems. OK, uh, I see there are two other questions, one from Joel and the other one from Emiliano. And maybe you, um, we can either leave for the end or you can answer them uh, on the pad. So thank you. So we now move to the Raman LIDARs and uh, uh, differential absorption LIDARs presented by Christine Nist of DWD. Christine? Yes, thanks, Nico. Okay, very um, good. So everybody can hear me and it seems the pointer works as yes. well. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, first of all, I would like to thank Alexander Heffele from uh, Meteo Swiss who supported me with some contents for this presentation. Talking about Raman LiDAR and dial systems, they are similar to silometers, so active optical based systems that uses pulses of laser radiation to probe the atmosphere and to provide high vertical and temporal resolution information. And what kind of information, um, similar to silometers, the scattering properties of atmospheric aerosols, plus, and this is in addition, they are also able to measure air temperature and humidity profiles, and both of these parameters are key parameters to fill um, the observational gap in the boundary layer. In contrast to silometers or ALCs, Raman LiDAR or dial systems are not that operated in a dense and extended network, but um, there's a lot of or a large bench of research instruments, but also some operational units that are measuring routinely at a number of um, national infrastructure sites. So coming to the additional um, parameters of air temperature and humidity profiles. They can be measured because of the measurement principle, starting with the Raman LiDAR system. The Raman LiDAR measures or detects, in addition to the um, back clanks, also um, signals at different wavelengths. And these signals emerge from scattering of molecules such as O2, N2 and water vapor, which absorb um, part of the photon's energy or add an amount of energy to the photon's energy, so-called inelastic scattering. This is actually uh, the Raman process. So by inelastic scattering, the molecules change their vibrational and rotational state. So the backscatter coefficient shown in the LIDAR equation by Simona before must be um, replaced by the Raman backscatter coefficient that is proportional to the um, number of scattering molecules. And from this um, information, water vapor mixing ratio can be obtained using the um, ratio between the signal from water vapor and nitrogen, where here the constant C is a calibration constant that can be obtained from radio sound profiles. Additionally, to water vapor mixing ratio, as I said, it's possible to measure um, temperature profiles that can be derived from the pure rotational Raman method. 
um, or spectrum using um, the ratio of spec scattered signals at two suitable um, spectral regions having different temperature dependency. So with the Raman um, principle, it's possible to measure temperature and humidity profiles, while um, the principle of the dial system is different and allows for observations of humidity profiles only. It uses elastic scattering at two different wavelengths really close together. One wavelength called the online wavelength is tuned to a water vapor absorption line. And the other one called the offline wavelength is um, close by, but tuned um, to a weekly or not absorbing um, water vapor absorption line. So the difference in the returns between um, between the two wavelengths is then due to absorption by water vapor molecules. So the measurement of the ratio um, of the backscatter, it's the two wavelengths as a function of range um, can be used to calculate the water vapor concentration profile. This is a classical dial approximation to retrieve the water vapor mixing ratio. So to summarize um, the products from dial and Raman LIDAR, as I said, Raman LIDAR and dial um, are able to measure specific humidity or water vapor mixing ratio with an uncertainty of about 10% or even less than 10% and the attenuated backscatter, while Raman LIDAR is also able to measure temperature profiles and provides additional char characteristic of aerosol, like aerosol backscatter coefficient and extinction coefficient. Um, the resolution in time and height in the boundary layer is really good. It's about a minimum one minute and in, uh, in vertical resolution about 10 meters. This is a bit lower in the free troposphere and both system measure during um, uh, have a large uh, range. They cover well the boundary layer that is needed particularly to fill the observational gap. Just to note here, this is just a summary of, of the products and their uncertainty. And this depends uh, not to a specific instrument, but uh, yeah, just from, from the um, latest publication um, seen below. Um, but important to mention here is that the quality so the uncertainty and the resolution in time and height is really, really useful for different applications and important ones such as um, shown um, for the routine and operational Raman LIDAR RIMO operated by Meteor Swiss at Payen. They uh, showed successful use for data assimilation and a, a positive NWP impact. The presentations um, are shown here. Uh, the publications are shown here. And this shows also a high potential for calibration and validation studies uh, for current and future water vapor temperature satellite missions. They also could show the usefulness of this data for climate science, um, particularly because of the long-term and uh, continuous observation of water vapor, where they could show uh, some trend analysis and coming to some dial um, applications. There will be a publication soon related to uh, the diurnal cycle of water vapor in the Arctic. And these data are based on a dial system, which is a pre-production version from Weisler. Um, this uh, instrument, it's quite new. And it's also operated at DWD uh, or by DWD in Lindenberg. And um, because um, of the pre-production version, um, it's um, assessed in terms of its operational readiness level. So from the technical point of view, it's really easy to, to mount and also to there's much uh, there's less to maintain. It's fully automatic running and it shows really promising results in several senses, like it captures, um, for example, subgrid scale meteorological phenomena. It shows a really good comparison against radio sound data for water vapor mixing ratio. The bias is less than 0.3 gram per kilogram. And also compared to model output, 
it shows really promising results that the data can be used for next step, for example, for NWP impact studies. But the applications shown here are really few, and I have seen also, especially for the Raman Leider, some of the authors of these publications and applications are present. So probably if you have more detailed questions, they can give a better answer than I do. So just uh, coming to a summary of benefits and challenges from Raman Leider and Dial. The technology of both systems is well understood and the maternity allows for operational use. Of course, there are always technical issues, particular laser maintenance or eye safety issues, particular if you want to operate such systems in a network. Um, Raman Leider and Dial provide continuous water vapor profiles that are important gap in the current observation systems, but not to forget the systems are weather sensitive, that limited data are avail available in and above optically thick clouds. The data resolution and quality meets um, the requirements of NWB, NWP and climate studies, and these systems are commercially available, and the ones that are available are fit for network applications, but still as a challenge, there are, there are only few ones. The system complements perfectly um, microwave radiometer and radiosond information. And uh, yeah, the Raman LIDAR also provides continuous temperature and relative humidity profiles plus the characterization of aerosols. But Raman LIDAR in contrast to dial systems need to be calibrated. So using um, external sensors. So this is all from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christine. Um, there was uh, one comment that uh, it disappeared somehow, but um, about uh, that th there is a, a Raman LiDAR network in the uh, UK, uh, nine operational LiDARs. I don't know, maybe you mentioned that and, and that's why it disappeared. I'm not sure. Um, and, um, and I have one question about the Raman LiDAR calibration. Can you say something about that? Just uh, something? Um, some more details, or you fit, you use the radio sound um, to okay. fit. Okay, so yeah. you need the radio sound. Okay, yeah. because I, I know that also you mentioned um, uh, complementary um, or kind of a synergy with the micro radiometers, and uh, I know that um, some radar, Raman LiDAR are also calibrated using the integrated water uh, path, uh, integrated water vapor from, uh, from the micro radiometer. Ah, okay. 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 Um, yeah. Okay, I guess that uh, we can then move to the next speaker or next uh, lecturer, I would say. And the um, next one would be uh, from uh, Anne Ilsiko, I believe, on the unmanned aerial vehicles. Anne Ilsiko from uh, FMI and she's the co-chair of working group three. Anne? Yes, hello you? everybody. And thank you, Nico, uh, for introduction. Uh, in probe, uh, we also consider uh, UAV, uh, which are not uh, remote sensing uh, sensors as all the other uh, sensors in this action are, but uh, these are new uh, emerging type of uh, measurements uh, which can give uh, vertical information uh, from atmosphere. Uh, UAV means uh, uh, unmanned uh, fixed wing planes, or they can be also mul multi rotor copters. And the measurements are made uh, with uh, in situ sensors uh, on board UAV. Um, meteorological services are interested in, uh, of course, meteorological variables, temperature pressure, humidity, and wind information. But uh, uh, some are also interested in gas, aerosol particle, and cloud properties that uh, different type of in-situ sensors uh, can provide. And there is currently lo lots of uh, research undergoing uh, in different research institutes, how uh, best measure uh, these different variables uh, both for meteorological service needs and then for research needs. 
And uh, these uh, observations can easily be used for calibration and validation of all, all of the sensors that uh, we have got introduction today. Uh, status of network, uh, there is actually no network currently. Uh, different national institutions are demonstrating uh, through research projects and uh, tests uh, uh, how best uh, operationally use UAV born observations. And based on tests, what uh, we have done in FMI and colleagues elsewhere, uh, it is very likely that, that we uh, get at least a European wide uh, network of these sensors in the future. Uh, measurement principle uh, is quite simple uh, flight path of uh, UAV uh, is really custom chosen. Uh, so one, one could uh, consider as a 3D, uh, but meteorological end users, they prefer to get vertical information in research projects. Uh, also aerial coverage of different variables is uh, important and required. Uh, UAV is equipped uh, with an in-situ sensor and choice of the sensor really uh, depends on balance between cost and uh, requirements uh, for accuracy and response time uh, for the sensor and application. But there are really good sensors uh, already available, so no, no custom build is necessarily, necessarily uh, required. And uh, these in-situ sensors require calibration as in any other use they would normally be used. Uh, challenges uh, with this technique, there are quite a few still uh, with them because this uh, developing technique uh, everybody understands that uh, this is not quite a uh, better resilience method, but nevertheless, uh, all the measurements that can be done before, uh, let's say, really stormy or wind, windy uh, weather, they are uh, valuable for weather services. It's not always needed to get uh, information through the bad condition. Uh, it's important to have observations before and after the conditions as well, and this is important uh, input for uh, with the models. Then there are different uh, regulations that regulate uh, use of UAV, and we always have to bear in mind safety of this technique. Uh, and then flying time and height uh, could be one of the limitations, depending on country where you operate. And then uh, this technique requires human resources. Uh, it cannot be left as a standalone system as all the other instruments we have heard today. But nevertheless, it has benefits. Uh, it can provide uh, meteorological information for forecasters in the same way as radio sounding, uh, standard radio sounding produces, but uh, it uh, can produce these observations in higher frequency that, than we can get uh, with radio sounding. And in this, this example, we have uh, some observations made every half an hour for, for dew point temperature and uh, temperature, and can, can see how boundary layer evolves during this specific morning from the first observation uh, during a couple of uh, next hours. And this is something that uh, we would have missed uh, with our standard radio sounding observation. And then, uh, yeah, so uh, with including uh, sensors uh, that uh, are not traditional, uh, uh, then we can provide observations which we couldn't get with other uh, profiling methods. Thank you very much from my side. Okay, thank you very much, Anne. And um, uh, I see there is one question on the pad uh, from Luca Ravnik. Uh, what are the methods and sensors to measure wind? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so wind is uh, quite difficult 
uh, but there are methods, uh, some use sonic anemometer technique for wind observation. And then you have to be careful where you, where you set up uh, your sensor. And then there are uh, some, some probe type of sensors, which uh, I'm not personally so familiar. Uh, but yes, there are techniques. And then uh, I know that uh, there are groups in the world uh, which also try to get wind information from telemetry information of UAV system. But that's something under development. OK, uh, thank you very much. And um, um, maybe, um, yeah, you mentioned that there are studies already uh, with the um, assimilating these uh, uh, UAV measurements. Are those already out? Uh, Actually, yes. Uh, uh, Meteor Swiss has done uh, already publication out of uh, data assimilation okay. with, with these observations. Okay. Uh, others are uh, studying currently. Okay. Okay. Maybe if, if you can put um, any reference on the on the pad later on, uh, that might be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we managed to uh, finish on time. The lectures only four minutes late, so that's great. And um, now I guess that uh, it's time for uh, any other questions. Uh, first of all, I would go through the um, the um, the pad and see if there are any uh, question that um, has not been uh, answered. And um, in the meanwhile, feel free to add any other question, um, maybe at the very uh, bottom so that I know that those um, came uh, later. So starting from the top, um, I see, I mean, most of the questions have been already answered by, uh, um, I mean, with text. So uh, you are welcome to uh, read directly, but uh, I see that um, at least there is one uh, question um, from Joel. Uh, it was there already, but um, we didn't have time to answer before. It was uh, for Simone uh, concerning the uh, automatic gliders and silometers. Uh, the question is, how important would you say the temperature correction for the Luft overlap is? Um, I don't think it is taken into account in e-profile at this moment. Um. Thank you for your question, Joel. Um, like with many of the products that we discuss, it depends a bit on how you use the data or what you want to learn from it. But if you are interested in uh, the near range, so the, the atmosphere very close to the surface, close to the sensor, uh, we found that the temperature correction of the optical overlap of the Luft systems is very, can be very important. Um, for example, if you want to use the att attenuated backscatter to detect shallow layers um, in the atmospheric boundary layers, or for example, nocturnal boundary layer height um, or under stable conditions, um, this correction give, can give a significant improvement to um, the profiles. And because with the detection of layer heights, we look at uh, changes in the profile um, in the vertical profile. Um, if you correct the, um, the temperature dependence, <clears throat> uh, it can really improve on the attenuated backscatter and help to, to detect shallow layers from the, from the measurement. So it's um, definitely um, a step that ePROFILE is going to uh, implement in the distant near, we don't know, future. <laughs> but um, uh, if we want to use the data for layer detection, it's important. Maybe I can quickly comment on, on the profiles. Yes, please. Idea. Um, uh, I completely agree that the overlap correction is, is very important for different applications, mostly for PEL um, part. Um, now, the First priority of ePROFILE is more on, on the on the retrieval side for uh, for extinction and and, uh, and backscatter profiles. 
and not mostly in the, in the overlap range. This is why the, the overlap correction will not be implemented like in the next one or two years, but uh, rather in the, in the a bit more distant future. But I, um, I have to say that the, the algorithms are here and there's the publication of Maxim Ervo et al in 2006, I think already. So, um, methods for correction are here, but it's just not, not implemented in the very close future. Okay, and, and just because we have a kind of a heterogeneous um, uh, audience, um, there was Rolf Rufenacht from Meta Suisse. Maybe you can present yourself just to say your role in uh, e uh, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry about this. <laughs> now the fraud. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm actually the network manager of the eProfile network, which is um, which is like UMetNet's network um, of uh, of ALCs and um, um, and wind providers, and soon also of uh, of uh, microwave radiometers. So, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Actually, we have uh, about 100 participants, uh, so that that's why I, I guess it is quite uh, heterogeneous. Uh, there are um, other questions, uh, more general. Um, one general question about the uh, um, all the active sensors, so they emit radiation, and um, about the regula regulations that are needed uh, from local to national uh, level. And um, most of these are uh, eye safe, at least uh, the Doppler wheel ladder and cilometers are classified as eye safe. So uh, probably the regulation is uh, uh, relatively uh, easy to um, manage. Um, maybe there are uh, regulations, I mean, I'm sure there are regulations more stringent uh, close to airports. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, for more powerful lighters, uh, then uh, the regulations are more uh, stringent. Um, yeah, yeah. I maybe, think yeah. it can be very different from one country to another, one location to another. So really, um, you have to find out uh, what are the agencies that are, are regulating emissions, electromagnetic wave uh, emissions. Sometimes you have a uh, agencies that are actually in charge of that need to be informed about any emission and in other times it's um, more uh, easier uh, and eye safety is one thing which is important but it is uh, um, could be different uh, from uh, just the fact that uh, you are actually emitting waves um, in the atmosphere um, it could still require some declaration, even if it's uh, I'd say. Okay, and uh, and um, maybe it would be nice to hear uh, any of you that has experience with the um, um, deployment uh, uh, around or in the area of an airport. What are the if there are any uh, limitations there? Um, so. There is another question about the uh, data availability. And um, so the radiation data have a unique database uh, where you, the Wyoming website where you can get pretty much, uh, I mean, many radiation uh, launches from uh, uh, worldwide. Um, the same for Meta and Synop. And um, the question is, it is possible to image a unique uh, database where download all the data that come from um, atmospheric provider or um, ABL providers. Um, well, it's it's a good question. I think eProfile is working in that direction. It's uh, eProfile uh, again is the uh, profiling program of the um, UMetNet, so the European Network of uh, uh, National Weather Services, and they are working. Uh, towards the distribution of um, um, data from uh, um, uh, ABL profilers. They already provide uh, data from the ALC and um, the wind profilers um, will also include micro radiometers. And there is already a, a common hub that is collecting the data and, uh, and providing the data back in, um, to the national weather services uh, so that they can be assimilated in the systems. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, then uh, accessible from uh, outside these um, bodies, I mean, outside from the national weather services, uh, 
probably not, but uh, maybe it will be uh, uh, available in the future. I don't know if what what, what is the policy um, currently and what will be the policy in the near future. Maybe Rolf again can give us uh, an insight there. Um, so yes, um, your summary you summarized the situation quite quite uh, nicely. Um, for the archived data, I can also say that um, for the ALC network, we have um, all the stations um, in the CETA archive with a latency of, I think, 48 hours. So 48 hours of the real time, they're freely available from there. And um, yeah, for, for the microwave radiometers, of course, it's, it's upcoming, it's not yet, it's not yet done. But, um... Okay, thanks. Um, there is one question from Ekaterina. Uh, is there any development on instruments during the past one, two years related to collaboration with and within Probe? Um, so, um, so the question is, any development on instruments during the past one or two years? So if there is any uh, research yes. and development with the instruments, um, we have so, seen several examples, I think, yes. uh, that are of, of uh, new instruments that are coming out and that are being evaluated, currently evaluated by some members, I think, of, of, of Probe. Um, I think Christine presented this for the, uh, in particular, for the dial uh, LiDAR of uh, Vaisala right, that is being currently evaluated at, DWD, that is uh, one example. Yeah. Um, I think there's also been changes to the firmware for many of the instruments as well. So that is also developments that have been made by the manufacturers. Yes. And uh, concerning micro radiometers, we are working with uh, some of the manufacturers to, um, uh, to uh, really characterized uh, all the um, all the processing chain to come up with the, uh, a better estimate of the uncertainty of the brightness temperatures. So that's not really a hardware, but it's more like a, a data processing uh, uh, development. I know that several probe uh, members were also. Um evaluating the uh, Vaisala CL61 ALC with the polarization capabilities. I mean, it's now it's an available product, but um, beforehand there was uh, work for different members. Okay, uh, there is one comment from Harold on this topic. Uh, um, so RPG is working on a standard standardization effort, uh, something like the uh, ISO, ISO standard um, at a later time, but now for, for, for now at a German national level. Um, and there is also another question from Antonio Yengo um, concerning a UAV, so to Anne, what is the range of heights that can be reached with the UAV for a vertical profile? Yes, really good question. Uh, it depends very much on uh, application. Uh, in Finland, uh, when we do uh, our operational observations, uh, we fly up to 500 meters, as I showed uh, in the example. Uh, then people doing uh, research, they fly over one kilometer here in Finland. Uh, they, ha they have applied the uh, restricted uh, area uh, to do such flights. So from my personal experience, uh, I say that uh, as operational, we fly up to 500 meters. And in future, I believe that the technique uh, for charging batteries uh, will develop in the way that uh, also higher flights are possible. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is yet one other comment about the uh, instrument development by Joel that in working group three and four, um, we are working on a document on firmware for oscillometers and also SOP. And um, yeah, and also they tested um, uh, a oscillometer and a dial 
um, so within these um, uh, efforts. And uh, she said, feel free to contact uh, if there are any questions. So we are approaching um, the end. We have two minutes to go. So I would uh, stop here. I, I think it, it, we answered all the questions as far as I can tell from the chat, I mean, from the pad. I didn't see any other question in the chat. Uh, someone is asking for um, a photo. Um, closing remarks. Oh, yes, we have uh, up, uh, the other upcoming events is our next introductory lecture, uh, 40 days from now on 25th of May. And um, we will talk about the networks. So we, today we talk about single instruments and 25th we will talk about the networks and uh, what are the efforts uh, that are uh, done uh, to establish these uh, networks, uh, at least in Europe. Uh, yes, we will talk about how networks, uh, what networks do exist, uh, how to benefit from them, and uh, how to join a network if you are running an instrument, and uh, how to access data uh, from the network. And I guess that was my last comment. And uh, then I just want to thank you very much for your active uh, participation and for your attention. And uh, I should say that uh, I've seen a maximum of 110 people uh, attending. And um, I think now we are about 80. So it means that uh, most of the people uh, remain connected throughout. So that was very good. Um, I think it was a successful uh, um, introductory uh, meeting. And uh, we'll look forward to um, your um, uh, involvement. If you want, just uh, send us an email or um, go on the website and join the um, as a probe user or uh, just as a, for the newsletter. So thank you very much to everybody and see you next time.